exams are mostly graded, but we don't have the numbers added up yet. Uh, I'll get the, the results will be posted on the web over the weekend. Have to get them all collated and everything. Uh, we don't need to talk about. It. Um, so let me just. There's also a very short web assignment due on Wednesday. There's only six problems, so it's short. Um, everybody's tired. The exams are awful. <laughs> I didn't see you crying during. Yeah. So it couldn't have been that bad. Yeah. Did, did you want me to add those two? So we could have had 11 problems? Okay, so we have this thing, and we already know 
what some of these are like because we know the geometric series. So we already know this one. And then on Monday, we used this to derive a bunch more. So we did things like taking, like making substitutions, like taking derivatives and integrating and so on. So for example, one thing that we came up from this at the end of the class, uh, should I go through this again, the Arctan? OK, so I'll just do this one quickly. This is still review. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can make a substitution. Here, replace this x with a minus x. So just by doing substitution, this series is just where I, everywhere I see an x here, I put a minus x. So there's no x there, so it stays the same. This x becomes a minus x. This x squared becomes a minus x quantity squared, which is still positive. This x becomes a minus x cubed, and so on, which would be this series. Uh, that's an n. n equals 0 to infinity minus 1 x to the n. And then we can do little tricks with it, like integrate it. So we know that the arctan of x is the integral of 1 over 1 plus x dx. So this is something that, that you know, right? This is the stuff you do know. Yeah, OK. And we can integrate this series term by term. So I'll just do it in this form rather than doing this, but the integral of this is an x. This is a minus x over x squared over 2, and so on. And we already checked that the constant in this case is 0, so I won't bother with it. And so that gives us uh, minus 1 to the n, x to the n over n, uh, no, 2n. What am I doing? Oh yeah, I want to square. See, he told me he could do it, but he was wrong. Um, I knew something was wrong. Uh, six. That's better. Okay. So when we integrate this guy, nothing happens to the minus 1. When we integrate x to the 2n, it becomes a 2n plus 1. Oh, we have to divide by 2n plus 1. And when we do this integration, we, well, it still starts at 2. Right? So all I did was integrate this, thinking of n as just some number I don't know. It's a constant. So the integral of minus 1 to the n is just minus 1 to the n. The integral of x to the 2n is x to the 2n plus 1 when I divide by. So there's the integral, which is the series, we can just plug back in, uh, x over what did I do wrong here? 1, yes, minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5th over 5 minus x to the 7th over 7th plus blah, blah, blah. Right, so this is what we did at the end of the last class. Now there is a constant of integration that comes out of this, but we checked already that it's 0 because the arctangent of 0 equals that constant, and in this case, is zero, because the arctangent of zero is zero. Okay? So we know that, in fact, 
when this series converges, the arctangent can be represented as a series. And this only converges, well, when does this converge? So this is something that was on the test. Maybe you got it right, maybe you didn't. So this is a power series. What is the radius of convergence of this? What do we do to check? The ratio, well, we should know already. Because what is the radius of convergence of that? One. Yes, so this converges for absolute x less than one. This one also only converges for absolute x less than one because that's what we started with. But sometimes the less thans become less than or equal to. So the interval of convergence on this one does not include, well, actually, yeah. does not include minus one, right? It's strict inequality here. But on this one, actually, we, we do pick up minus one. Plus one, sorry. So, but let's just check. So by the ratio test, We need to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value. Now here I want to replace n, n by n plus 1. Yeah. So, okay, so now what we're doing, I mean, I already know the answer. And I already told you the answer, but let's just confirm. We have a series in our hands. It's a power series. It's reasonable to ask. For what values of x does this make sense? So I want to know what is the interval of convergence. And so I'm going to confirm first off that for x less than 1 in absolute value, I still have the same convergence. So I'm going to look at, by the ratio test, what is a n plus 1 divided by a n, take the limit, I want that less than 1. So in this case, my n plus first term is what I get when I plug in an n plus 1 for n here. So that will be, there's this minus 1 to the end, but I don't care about it. Let me write it anyway. x to the, well when n is n plus 1, that's 2 times n plus 1 plus one more, so that will be 2n plus 3. Does everyone see that? Or should I write it? Let me write it down. Uh, I'm not going to have room. And then here, same thing, 2n plus 1 plus 1. And now I have to divide by a n, so that will give me minus 1 to the n. I don't have enough room. Minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1. Uh, and then on the top, I have a 2n plus 1. Right? That's the ratio that I want to calculate. So this is 2n plus 3. This is 2n plus 1. So let me write equals here. Um, so the minus 1 to the n plus 1 over minus 1 to the n gives me a minus 1, but I'm taking an absolute value, so forget it. 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 plus 1 is 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. x to the 2n plus 3 over x to the 2n plus 1 is x squared. And I take the absolute value, and I take the limit as n goes to infinity. So, what is this limit? Right, it's the absolute of x squared, but x is, that's always positive, so this is just x squared. So this will converge when x squared is less than 1 in absolute value. So that's the same thing x is less than 1. Right? But
but now I still need to check what happens when x is 1 and what happens when x is minus 1. So if x equals 1, because the ratio test gives me no information when the ratio is 1. I know it, it diverges if x is bigger than 1, and it converges when x is, when x is less than 1, but I don't know about when x equals 1 or minus 1. So when x is 1, the series becomes uh, the sum minus 1 to the n times 1 over 2 to the n plus 1. So does this converge or diverge? What? No, it's not a p-series. It's an alternating series and the limit is zero. So this is an alternating series. It's decreasing and the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 2n plus 1 to zero. So it converges. Okay, and we also have to check what if x is minus 1, then I get minus 1 times minus 1, minus 1 to the n, minus 1 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. Alright, this is x. x is minus 1. So, this is, if n is an even number, minus 1 to the n is plus 1. And if n is an even number, 2n plus 1 is an odd number. Right? So, well, 2n plus 1 is always an odd number. This is always an odd number. Let me just write it this way. Minus 1 to the n, minus 1 to the odd, over 2n plus 1. So this alternates. <clears throat> minus 1 to an odd power is always minus 1. So this actually equals minus 1 to the n to the minus sign. Well, this, still, this is still an alternating series. It's just negative. It starts with a minus. If you want, this is minus 1 to the n plus 1. And so, this still converges. So that means that the interval of convergence picked up the 2x. So, this is true. Arctan of x, and there's a little more than it, is then this series minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1, over 2n plus 1, starting at 0. And this happens for x including plus and minus 1. So what can happen when you manipulate these series and pick up other ones is you can slightly change the interval of convergence. Not a lot, but the ends can either add on or fall off. Because it's very delicate what happens at the end of the series. Which is why we have to do this special testing. When we have a series, the ratio test is like a very crude implement. The ratio test, it gives you a definite answer, but it doesn't deal with the delicate work. It's like a sledgehammer. It's not really good for eating little fine bones out of sand. And you have to do something more delicate like this to see what happens when you have little fine things to work with. Okay. So this is not actually what I'm talking about today. Except I used half the class on it, so that's good. So, we have this business where we can take an old series that we know, such as 
the geometric series and produce functions of other ones. But what if we want to go the other way? What if we have a function that we know and we can see what they add up to? They're functions that we know sometimes. What if we have a function that we know and we want to produce a series for it? This is useful because the series allow us to do calculations just with multiplication and addition for things which are expressed in more complicated ways. So it allows us to, to treat things that are transcendental or, or functions that are more complicated in terms of simpler things. And it, but only when it converges. So, so what if So we have some function that we want. Let me take e to the x. But what I'm going to tell you works for like any nice function. Uh, so we have our function. So that's my example. And I want a series. Not do you want a series. This is that raises a question, so I need to put in. I want to produce a series for a known function. Do I have any hope of doing that? Well, good, yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't be asking. So, yeah. So, let's just start going. What do we know? Well, let's just look at zero. So, if x is zero, we know e to the x. One. So already we know the first term of the series. Near zero, the series has to start with a one. If it started with a three, it would be wrong. We know our series is going to start with a one. If there is a series, it has to start with a one. Right? Everybody clear on that? Yeah. What? No, it has to look like sums of powers of x's. It has to look like a polynomial. So it won't be e to the n, because that would sort of do no good. It's like saying, you know, if I want a series for e, well, first calculate e. Something not useful about that. So. So, so what I've said is, if e to the x is some constant plus another constant times x plus another constant times x squared plus another constant times x cubed plus blah, 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 well then, e to the, e to the this one has to be 1. Yeah. How do you know the use of the power series for that? I don't. I'm saying if there is a power series for it, this is what it has to look like. So, it didn't say that there will be a power series for it, but in fact, there has to be, because at least with a radius of convergence zero, because I know that e to the zero is one, so if I let all of these terms be zero, It'll be 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. So, so that means for sure that the power series has to look like 1 plus something. It just might not converge for any value except x equals 0. Because I know the first term is 1. And that works. So now let's see if we can make it a little better. So this one goes up here. See if we can make it a little better. So what would the second term be? So how can we figure out what the second term would be? No clue? So why did this work? Why did I figure out that if e to the x, let me just say it this way instead. 
we'll say it this way instead. So I claim that if this is true, then C0 is 1 since 1 is e to the 0. And if I plug in 0 here, I get C0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, etc. So the first term has to be 1. If this is true, then this has to be true. There's no other choice. So how might I be able to get at what this term is? Huh? Well, if I put 1 equal to x, then I will get, so it's a good try, it's wrong, but it's a good try. So, then it will tell me that e is 1 from the c0 plus c1 plus c2 plus c3. Uh, that doesn't tell me a lot. That tells me that the sum of all these numbers has to be 1.718 stuff. That's not so useful. So, I mean, this is not an obvious thing, right? This was figured out by Taylor and McLaurin in the 18th century. They were smart guys. So, so, try taking the derivative. Now, maybe because I said the word Taylor, you said, oh, I know about the Taylor series. Ah! Yeah. Because the first term is a constant. It doesn't change. A constant means no matter what x is, it's the same. Right? The first term doesn't have an x in it. It's a number. Okay, so, so he suggests taking the derivative because I gave a clue. So let's take the derivative. We know that e to the x, well, we want e to the x to be c0 plus, well, it's already a 1. So if this is true, then the derivative is, well, the derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of c1x is c1. The derivative of c2x squared is 2c2x. The derivative of c3x cubed is 3c3x squared and so on. And in general, this will be the sum of n times what this guy is the sum of c n x to the n. Then this guy will be the same as that one, but I put an n in front of everything. And I take the power down by one. Right? And I take the derivative I bring the power down, and I decrease it by 1. Well, that's good, because we know what the derivative of e to the x is. It's e to the x. And so now we can play the same trick that we just used. We know that e to the 0 is also c1. So e to the 0, which is 1, is also C1. So now we know two terms. This is not us. So don't worry about that. We have another surprise exam next Wednesday. Um, okay, so we know that We know that. Because when we took the derivative, 
we've managed to do the same trick as before. We now know the value of the derivative. So what, what might work to get this guy? Yeah. Take the second derivative. So we take the derivative of this. So if we take the derivative of e to the x, this is the derivative of what's up here. So that will be, well, this is 2c2. And then here I get 2 times 3c3x. And then the next term that is written here will be 4 times, uh oh, what is it already? Oh no. This one is 4c4, and I'll get 4 times 3c4, c4. It's not an explosive. x squared plus stuff. And in general, this will be the sum of n times n minus 1 whenever those c's were before I didn't read that room, sum n, n minus 1, whatever those c's were before, x to the n minus 2. And again, I can plug in. Yes? I took the derivative of this line. I don't know x yet. You say how'd you get c1? How'd I get? This is the 1 from this line. C1 is 1. So the trick was, we started here saying, I don't know anything except the first term. But I know the function at 0. So now I know the first term. Now I want the second term. Well, if I take the derivative, the first term goes away, and the second term becomes the first term. So that was what I did here. I see your question is set. And then I did it again. So okay. C1 is x. Do you agree with me or no? I mean C1 is 1, sorry. Okay, so forget everything and just look at this line. E to the x is C1 plus 2 times some crap times x, plus 3 times something times x squared, plus 4 times something times x cubed. Let x be 0. Then this is some number plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, etc. If I plug in 0 for x in this line, I get the number that I want plus a bunch of zeros. So the number that I want is one. OK, you had a question. You're good now. OK. And then, well, it works so good once, maybe it'll work great another time. So we take the derivative again. And now we can plug in e to the 0 is twice c2. It's not c2, but it's twice c2. Again, plus. 0 plus 0 plus 0. So that means that C2, twice C2 is 1, so C2 is a half. And then I can do it again. Yeah. This? Okay, so I took the derivative of this one. This line, here I had a 3c through x squared. So when I took the derivative of that, the 2 came down, gave me a 2 times 3. And then here I have a 4 times 3c4 x squared. And the next term that I didn't write is a 5 times 4c5 x cubed. So in general, because I took the derivative twice, this is what I got. Okay? And we just keep going. Can anyone tell me what C3 will be? One sixth. One sixth, yes. 
Well, we'll see 4B then. So if we just keep doing this, Cn will be 1 over n factorial. Okay? Because every time I take a derivative, I bring the power down. And so when I take the derivative of this, this is a 6. When I take the derivative of this, this is 4 times 3 times 2. When I take the derivative of this, this is 3. And so on. 5 times 4 times 3, but then take the derivative again, it's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. Take the derivative again, it's 5 factorial. And so on. And in general, each derivative brings another power down and lets it play in the game. And since we're only looking at the first term of the derivative, we pick up what we want. Okay, so what does that mean we've just shown? We've just shown that if this stuff works, just show that if e to the x is some power series, then it has to be this one. We didn't show that it is this one. We just said that if it is one, it has to be that one. But now we can check when that one converges. So if this, if there is any answer to this question, the answer has to be that. If it's not that, it can't be anything else. At, at zero. So how do we check? We use the ratio test. We look at for, so we have to say, when does this convert? We use the ratio test. And that's an easy one. We take the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial divided by x to the n over n factorial. The x's cancel, leave me one x on top. And this is n factor n plus one factorial over n factorial. Right? n factorial is n times da da da. This is n plus 1 times n factorial, so everything cancels except the first one. And this limit is 0, no matter what x is. So since 0 is always less than 1, no matter what x is, it converges everywhere. So, if we wanted to know what e to the seventh was, we could just add up the powers of seven, dividing them by the um, by dividing them by n factorial. So, this gives us another representation of e to the x. Now, notice that this trick didn't really rely on much about e to the x. I just used e to the x because taking derivatives was easy. But the process that we went through, we could do this with any function provided that we know how to evaluate the function at zero. Right? Exactly what I did works for any function. 
Maybe it gives us a series that doesn't convert everywhere, but we can do this process for any function whatsoever. So, let me just do it for another function, and I'll do it a little faster. Okay, we'll just leave that. Oh, I still have that work. So let's use that. So I'll still do it with just an ordinary function. I'll do it with a specific function rather than just writing it with f. I'll do it with f later. Uh, so, so suppose, what, what function should I use? Sign? Okay. So, let's do the cosine just because, well, I can do the sign. So for the sign, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it a little more efficiently because this process was long. It doesn't have to be so long. So we know that, so I'm going to say that the sign is some series. So I want this to be cn x to the n. So since the sign of 0 is 0, this means that c1, or c0, is 0. Was I off by, no, c0, right. right. The first term that I get is 0, because when I plug this in, When I plug in x equals 0 here, I get c0 plus a bunch of zeros. When I plug in x equals 0 here, I get 0. So c0 is 0. Okay, now we look at what's the derivative of the sine. This is the cosine. And the cosine of 0 1. And since the cosine of 0 is 1, when I take the derivative of this, that gives me c1. So already, we know that the sine near 0 is, one, is x. So we've already seen that which, if you've taken physics, they use this all the time. If you remember back to calculus 1, the sine is about x because it's about the same as its derivative. So now we do it again. If I take the second derivative of the sine, this is the derivative of the cosine, which is minus the sine. Minus the sine of 0, 0. That tells me that 2c2 is 0. 4c2 so is 0. Now I do it again. Take the third derivative of the sine. It's minus the cosine. Minus the cosine. 0 minus 1. That tells me that 3 factorial, which is 6, C3 is minus 1. So C3 is minus 1 over 6.
So that means that what we have so far is that the sine of x is about the same as x minus x cubed over 6. And then there's more stuff. This is for x small. Okay, so now we want to keep going. Take the derivative again. So the derivative of minus the cosine is the sine. And that's 0. And so that next term is another 0. Yeah. I have 3 factorial. 3 times 2. It's important that it's 3 times 2. And in fact, this tells us that 4 factorial C4 is 0. But that's the same as saying C4 is 0. Because every time I take a derivative, I multiply the coefficient by the power of the original term that I started with, so I just keep building up. Right? This is really the fourth power in the series. And so when I take the derivatives to peel it off, I have 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So if I do it again on the fifth power, we already have it, but okay. The fifth power is 1. Well, let me write it. Which means that the next term is a plus 1 over 5 factorial. Uh, wait a minute, somewhere I'm off. Okay, what did I do wrong? That's 1 over 3 factorial, the 4 is dead. Yeah, yeah that's right. Did I do that too fast? That it's 1 over 5 factorial? So if we just keep going, notice what happens to the, to the derivatives. I have a 0, a 1, a 0, a minus 1, a 0, a 1, a 0, a minus 1, a 0, a 1, da da da. Right? Because this story repeats every four times. This is a sine, this is a cosine, this is a minus sine, this is a minus cosine, this is a sine, this is a cosine, minus sine, minus cosine, sine, cosine, blah, blah, blah. So that tells me what the series is. The series is the odd powers divided by the odd numbers factorial with an alternating sign. that I can write this as 
starting at 0, x to the x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial, but I want it to alternate. Huh? Uh, n equals 0, no, I want it to be positive on the first time. Okay. So I make that mistake all the time, so you shouldn't feel bad. Um, yeah, since I'm starting at 0, because I want x to the 1 to be the first term. If we do the same thing for the cosine, which I won't do right now because we only have one minute left, then we'll get x to the even powers alternating. Um, so we still need to know the interval of convergence Because maybe this is only true for x equals 0. It's actually true for bigger than x equals 0, but not all of them. So let's, I'll stop there. We'll do that on Monday.